Outlines of the Story of Christianity in Britain. Chapter 4. L. Lawrenson. Editor of Loving Words. Second Edition. Edinburgh, J.K. Souter and Company, 2 and 3, Bristol Place. Scotland's Confessors and Martyrs. In a previous chapter, we have seen how Columba had visited Scotland in the 6th century and founded a settlement in Iona, from which the light of truth for some time shone out amidst the surrounding darkness. However, as Columba's successors began to lose the clear views of truth which he had taught, the light grew dim, and soon Romish superstition took the place of the Gospel of Christ. The heathen Norsemen, too, often harassed the settlement. In 795, they plundered and burned it. In 875, it was again attacked and 68 persons murdered. King David I, in the 12th century, in his zeal for the church, finally drove out the settlers and planted a colony of French monks instead, and now truly was Scotland at the feet of Rome. But no country owned the sway of the Pope for a shorter period. Its brave and warlike inhabitants, who had so often hurled back the southern chivalry, could ill brook the domination of a foreign priest, and the country, as a whole, could never be said to be very devoted to Rome. Even in the time of King Robert the Bruce we find Pope John XXII complaining that the land had never been thoroughly purged from heresy. These heretics were, no doubt, some who had remained faithful to the teaching of the early evangelists, and amidst all the corruptions of that profligate age were endeavoring to keep themselves unspotted from the world. By and by Wycliffe's testament found its way northwards, and we read of one, Murdoch of Hart Hill, who had a copy which he kept concealed in a vault, and read to his family at midnight. Another, named Gordon, also had a copy, and used to read portions to a little company gathered in a lonely wood near his house. How dark and unhappy these times must have been. The people were in utter ignorance of the word of God. Only a manuscript copy of the testament was to be found here and there, and those who possessed it had to hide it with the greatest secrecy, as it meant death to be found reading the scriptures in the common tongue. And Scotland, too, had its confessors and martyrs for Jesus Christ. In 1406 James Riskby, who had learned the truth from John Wycliffe, was committed to the flames at Perth. In 1420 we find Scotland possessed a heretical inquisitor in the person of the abbot of Scone. In 1431 Paul Crar was burned at St. Andrews. His tormentors forced a ball of brass into his mouth to prevent him addressing the people gathered round the stake. But all the efforts of the Prince of Darkness could not keep out the light which by the grace of God was rising over the nations. Nearly a hundred years pass away, and we stand by the stake of one of Scotland's greatest sons, Patrick Hamilton, who was burned in 1528. Born of a noble family in 1504, Hamilton received his education at St. Andrews, and afterwards proceeded to the continent. Seeking after light, the learned disputations of the doctors of the Sorbonne did not satisfy him, and he went on to the College of Marburg, which had been newly founded by the Landgrave Philip of Hesse. Here he met Francis Lambert, the friend of Zwingle, who said of him, I have scarcely ever met a man who expressed himself with so much spirituality and truth on the word of the Lord. Soon his one object was to return to his native land and preach the gospel of full and free salvation. But Scotland had never been more under the power of the priests than at the present moment. The rash King James IV, with all his principal nobility, had fallen on the dark and bloody field of Flodden, and the profligate Bishop Beaton grasped the power of government during the feeble minority of James V. Nevertheless, Hamilton, who had fully counted the cost, returned home to his family near Linlithgow. He was first used in being the means of the conversion of several in his own home. He also visited in the houses of the gentry, where he was known and respected, and sought to win souls for Christ. He preached in the fields, and in the highways and byways spoke to individuals, ever seeking to sow the good seed of the word of God. Beaton grew alarmed. If this continued, the priests were undone, but Hamilton was of the blood royal, and the archbishop had to act with caution. His first object was to get the young king out of the way for the time. This he accomplished by inducing him to go on a pilgrimage to the shrine of St. Duthac, Indiana Rosshire, there to pray for his soul's health. Afterwards, cloaking his dark designs under a plea of church reformation, he invited Hamilton to visit him at St. Andrews. Here, after a few weeks of freedom, he was arrested in his lodgings at the dead of night, and conveyed through the silent streets to the dungeons of the bishop's castle. 
A few days afterwards he appeared before Beaton, who was attended by a numerous body of the principal bishops and abbots of Scotland. Prior Campbell, having read the indictment, burst out into a torrent of invective. Heretic, said he, thou sayest it is lawful for all men to read the New Testament. Heretic, thou sayest it is lost labor to call on the Virgin Mary as a mediator. Heretic, thou sayest it is vain to say masses for the release of souls from purgatory, and much more in the same strain. Beaton pronounced sentence of death, and every voice on the tribunal said, Away with him to the fire. At noon he was chained to the stake, the faggots heaped round, and a bag of gunpowder placed at his feet. The powder exploded, wounding the martyr in the face, but the wood was green and would not burn. Another supply was got with like result, his limbs were scorched, but the fire did not reach his body. Six hours has the martyr stood on the pile of suffering, but now the end has come, the glory is near. One standing by said, If thou still holdest true to thy doctrine, give us a sign. The iron band round his waist was red hot, his whole body was burning in the fire, but raising his hand he held it in the flame till the fingers dropped into the fire. His last words were, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and so he entered into the joy of his Lord. Surely great grace was given to him in his great need, for it is said that no impatient word escaped his lips, as through such protracted sufferings he patiently waited for the end. But the death of Patrick Hamilton did more for the cause of truth than his life could have done, as one said, the rake, smoke, of Hamilton infected everyone it blew upon. Numbers came forward to fill the ranks of those who had fallen. The priests were furious, but despite their utmost vigilance, there was now that to contend with which defied all their efforts. Copies of Tyndall's New Testament, printed at Worms in 1526, were being brought into Scotland, concealed in packages of goods and even bags of flour, till they could be distributed over the country. A mandate was issued that the scriptures, or any book that contained a quotation from them, were not to be read by the people, yet the people bought them and read them, and believed unto everlasting life. The priests resorted to their favorite plan of burning all whom they could lay hands on. Straiton and Gourlay were burned at Greenside, Edinburgh. Russell and Kennedy were burned at Glasgow. Forrest, with four other confessors, were burned on the Castle Hill. Of Forrest, we read that he was in the habit of beginning at six o'clock in the morning to read the scriptures, and that he committed to memory three chapters every day, which he repeated to his servant at night. But the murder of individuals was too slow a process for the cruel and vindictive David Beaton, who was now at the head of the Roman hierarchy. He meditated a Scotch Bartholomew and compiled a list of over a hundred Protestants to be assassinated at one time. This list contained the names of Lord Hamilton, the first peer in Scotland, and many of the nobility who had been led to see the errors of Rome. But James V dying of grief after the Battle of Solway Moss, this list was found on his person, and the nobles, aghast at the diabolical plot thus revealed, elected the man the priest intended to slay, as regent of the kingdom during the minority of the infant queen, Mary Stuart. Thus God, who mocketh even the wrath of man to praise him, overruled the evil designs of the priests for the good of his people, and though the cardinal forged a will appointing himself regent, yet the nation knew the profligate priest too well either to believe him or entrust him with a power he would have wielded for his own selfish ends. Next year, 1543, by act of parliament, it became lawful for every subject in the realm to read the Bible in his mother tongue, and then might be seen the Bible lying upon every gentleman's table, the New Testament openly borne about in men's hands, and thereby did the knowledge of God wondrously increase. The same year George Wishart returned from the continent, and now God had given to Scotland an open Bible and a faithful preacher. Wishart was born in 1512. For some years he was connected with an academy in Montrose, and is said to have been the first who taught Greek in Scotland. While here he became suspected of heresy, and not yet fully established in the truth he retired to the continent to escape the coming storm. In Switzerland he met Bullinger and others of the Swiss evangelists, and became strongly imbued with the earnest evangelistic spirit which marked these pious men. Returning to Scotland, as we have said, at the close of 1543, he found that the regent Aaron's zeal for the truth had been short-lived. Self-interest and worldly policy had led him for a time to favor those who were contending for the faith, but his heart was in the world, and he shaped his conduct accordingly. Let us look for a moment into the Franciscan convent at Stirling, and there humbly kneeling before a shaven priest we shall see the man who swayed the sovereign power of Scotland.
he is solemnly recanting his opinions and receiving absolution for departing from the true church. And now the weak tool is ready for the work of the scheming prelate. A marriage had been proposed between the young Queen Mary and the heir of Henry VIII. But the priests saw an end to their power if an alliance was formed with Protestant England, and the crafty and strong old beaten having got the regent into his power, the treaty with England was abandoned, and one with Popish France put in its stead. Bluff King Henry was indignant at the breach of faith, and one day an English fleet sailed up the Forth and cast anchor in Leith Roads. There was no one to oppose them, and Hereford's soldiers disembarked next morning, pillaged Leith, and fired Edinburgh, which they left burning for three days, returning to their own country after putting to death every man, woman and child they met with. We can easily understand something of the opposition that George Wishart was likely to meet with at a time when the priests held so much political power, as he began, in spite of their edict forbidding discussion on the doctrines of scriptures, to expound the epistle to the Romans to the large audiences who everywhere hung upon his words. He was the greatest orator Scotland had listened to for centuries. In Dundee crowds were drawn together wherever he preached. With convincing eloquence he showed that all had sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then he spoke of the one man by whom sin entered, and passed on to the one man by whom came the free gift, showing that justification was not to be obtained by works or penance, but being justified by faith we have peace with God. This good work was suddenly interrupted by the regent and the cardinal, who with a train of siege artillery, sought to capture both the town and the preacher, but the citizens retiring took their preacher with them till the danger was over, when they quietly returned, and the meetings went on for some months as before. But Beaton was on the alert, and got a summons delivered to him in the Queen's name, to depart and trouble the town no more with his presence. Wishard deemed it wise to obey, and, persecuted in one city, he went to another. Every church door was now closed to the faithful evangelist, but like his master of old, on the hillsides and in the fields he preached the word of life to the listening thousands who surrounded him. It was a time of real revival wrought by the Holy Spirit of God. Profligate sinners were seen with tears of repentance rolling down their faces, and change of life gave evidence to the reality of their conversion. Men were led to see not only the errors of Rome that could be understood by mere intellect, but their own state as sinners before a holy God, and their need of a divine substitute in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. This could only be wrought by the Spirit, who alone can convince of sin and produce true repentance by taking the eye away from self, to rest on Christ, who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification. The plague broke out in Dundee a short time after Wishard left, and he hastened back to minister to the sick and the dying. They need comfort, said he, and perchance the hand of God will make them magnify and reverence that word which before, for fear of men, they set at light part. By his advice and help, food and medicine were distributed among the sick. Mounted on the top of the battlements at the east port he preached from the text, he sent his word and healed them a fitting text for such an audience. Outside were the plague stricken from the lazar houses that stood near the gate. Inside were the terrified citizens haunted by the fear that they too might be the next victims. The cardinal took care to keep away from Dundee while the plague was raging, but hearing Wishart had returned he hired a priest to assassinate him. The would-be murderer waited at the foot of the stairs with a naked dagger concealed under his cloak till the preacher should descend. Something in the man's manner betrayed him, and Wishart going up to him said, Friend, what would you, at the same time taking hold of his right arm and revealing the concealed knife? The crowd rushed in and would have torn him to pieces, but Wishart shielded him from their fury and allowed him to escape. Among the sick he was unsparing in his labors for the benefit both of soul and body. He carried food to those who were still able to partake of it, and ministered the comfort of the gospel to those who were dying. He sometimes referred to an incident that happened to him when abroad which stirred him up to more devoted charity. Meeting a Jew one day while sailing on the Rhine, he labored to convince him that Jesus was the Messiah. I can never believe, said the Jew, that you Christians are the followers of the Messiah, because ye abrogate the holy law which was given to our fathers. Ye see the poor perishing among you, yet ye are not moved to pity. Secondly, it is forbidden by the law of God to make any imagery of things in heaven or things on earth, yet your chambers are full of idols. A piece of bread bacon upon the ashes ye adore and worship, and say it is your God. Wishart never forgot these true censures which became a lesson, not only to himself but to others. 
Leaving Dundee at the close of 1545, Wishart passed on to Edinburgh, preaching in the different towns and villages till he came to East Lothian. He had already experienced the cardinal's hatred, and he had a presentiment that his work was almost accomplished, that his end was near. A few weeks before he was arrested, he preached at Inverisk. Gentle, winning, and persuasive as his usual manner was, yet he could be stern and unsparing when he came to attack the vices of Rome, and in this address he gave a scathing, vehement denunciation of the practices of the false and idolatrous church. At the same time he told the people of the shortness of the time he had to travail among them, and of his death which now approached nearer than anyone there would believe. The last time he preached was at Haddington, and before he left the town he took an affectionate farewell of all his friends. The man they loved was going from them, and their hearts were sad because he had told them that they should see his face no more. John Knox, whom we shall meet again, earnestly desired to accompany him, but he, fully persuaded that martyrdom awaited him, would not consent, saying go back to your duties, one is enough for a sacrifice. Accompanied by a few friends he set out on foot for the house of John Cockburn of Warmiston. When supper was over he gave a short address, seeking to encourage the few friends still around him, and closed by singing the 51st Psalm in Old Scotch Meter. Have mercy on me now, good Lord. After thy great mercy. And dismissing the company with the parting words, Now, may God grant quiet rest, he went off to bed. But there was to be no more rest on earth for this devoted servant. The few days left are to be spent in captivity and suffering, the martyr crown is to be won, and then, faithful unto death, he shall receive the crown of life. A band of men from the cardinal, led by Earl Bothwell, had been searching for him, at midnight they surrounded the house and took the evangelist prisoner. He was instantly carried off to St. Andrews and thrown into prison. Wishart was well assured of the fate which lay before him, but he knew whom he believed, and his mind was in perfect peace. On February 28, he was brought out to a mock trial before the cardinal and condemned to the flames to be burned to death on the following day. Early next morning the preparations began. The stake was erected before the bishop's palace. Chains, fire and faggots were prepared for the martyr. Cushions and drapery lined the palace windows, that Beaton and his friends might luxuriously repose thereon while they feasted their eyes on the sufferer's dying agonies. The guns of the castle were loaded and turned on the scaffold to prevent any chance of rescue. Wishart's friends received permission to see him for the last time. They found him in the dungeon, full of triumphant grace. Consider and behold my visage, said he, ye shall not see me change my color. The grim fire I fear not, for I know surely that I shall sup with my Saviour this night. At noon he was led forth surrounded by soldiers. His hands had been tied behind his back like a common criminal, a chain was round his waist and a rope round his neck. At the stake he fell upon his knees, and said, O, oh, thou Saviour of the world, have mercy upon me. Father in heaven, I commend my spirit into thy hands. Then he prayed for his accusers and enemies, also for his brethren in the faith, when, the fire being lighted, he was quickly surrounded by the flames, and his body burned to ashes. The murder of Wishart was not sanctioned by the estates. Many of the nobles cared little for the cause of Christ, but a great deal for worldly power, and they could ill abide the proud priest usurping the highest prerogative in the state without their consent. A conspiracy was formed against him, three short months pass, and sixteen daring men succeed in surprising him in his strong castle, on which he had spent vast sums, and which he believed to be impregnable. Roused by the noise, the wretched man is met on the stairs, and James Melville exhorts him to repent of his wicked life, as he passes his short sword once and again through his bosom. A few short years and the magnificent buildings on which the murdered prelate had spent so much labor, that he might be safe to plot and carry out his wicked deeds, but in which he met his just doom, are swept away, and all that remains are a few heaps of ruins. Truly, even the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. The priests filled up the vacancy by the nomination of Hamilton, brother to the regent, and immediately proceeded to besiege the castle in which many of the reformed party had taken refuge. After holding out for sixteen months it was taken by the assistance of a French fleet, and among the prisoners shipped off to the galleys was John Knox, destined to be the leader in the final emancipation of Scotland from the yoke of Rome. Once again it seemed as if the priests had triumphed, and they prepared as usual to celebrate their victory in fresh persecution of the humble followers of Jesus. Walter Mill, an old man, of eighty-two years, was arrested and brought before Hamilton. 
At his trial he had to be assisted into court, but his faith was strong and his voice gave no uncertain sound. I will not recant, said he, for I am corn, and not chaff, and will not be blown away with the wind. He was condemned. A rope was wanted to bind the old man to the stake, but not a merchant in essay. Andrews would sell one for the purpose, so greatly was the action of the archbishop detested. As he stood by the stake he said, I trust one shall be the last to suffer death in Scotland for this cause, and his words have proved true. He died on the August 28, 1558. During the night the people raised a great heap of stones on the ashes of the martyr, and, though the priests removed them day after day, yet this heap of witness duly rose again in the morning.